Good afternoon. National Assembly of Wales is now in session. And the first item this afternoon is questions to the First Minister. And question one, Rebecca Evans. Will the First Minister make a statement on services for people with mental ill health? Yes, I'd refer the member to the Minister for Health and Social Services speech in the plenary debate on mental health last week. Thank you, First Minister. Havel's latest campaign reminds us that people with a serious mental illness have a life expectancy which is around 17 years lower than for people without, and that's usually down to preventable physical health problems. How is the Welsh Government ensuring that people get the right support from their health professionals and that care plans properly address the physical implications of mental ill health? Well, I can say that we wholeheartedly support the Let's Get Physical campaign, which the Minister actually launched last month. Uh, and, of course, particularly the way in which it's empowering individuals to take control of their own physical health uh, as well as their own uh, mental health. Uh, there is uh, much evidence that regular physical exercise can improve mental well-being in the wider population. Uh, and, uh, in addition, we also support healthy lifestyles through a range of programmes, including Let's Walk Cymru and the National Exercise Referral Scheme. Darren Miller. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. First Minister, very pleased to hear that you support Haval's campaign. Uh, your government has made a very clear commitment to ring-fence uh, National Health Service expenditure on mental ill health. So I was very disappointed to read in the latest statistical uh, release that spending from 2011-12 to 2013 on mental health has actually fallen from £641.8 million to £617.5 million. Uh, pounds. Uh, and decreased also in percentage terms against the NHS budget uh, from 11.9% in 2011-12 to 11.4% in 2012-13. Given that you've made this very clear commitment as a government, and it's a commitment on which we agree, um, why on earth aren't you fulfilling it? Well, we have, of course, uh, put in further investments, such as the extra money into dementia services, the money into uh, CALMS, the money to run our veterans' mental health and well-being service as well, and, of course, the capital money that's gone into the residential units in Bridgend and, indeed, in, in Abergele, uh, as well as the uh, new facilities for elderly mental health services at Wrexham, Milo, Llandoch and Glan Reid Hospital. So, uh, indeed, there's been extra spending uh, on uh, mental health that uh, may not be included in the figures the member has quoted. Ellen Parrott. Uh, Jill Flowith. Um, First Minister, notwithstanding the commitments in Together for Mental Health, a number of constituents have raised with me concerns about the transition between child and adolescent mental health services and adult mental health services. What more can the Welsh Government be doing to make sure that that transition is managed appropriately so those very vulnerable young people receive the appropriate level of support throughout their um, health care pathway? Yes, I mean, the, that transition is important, as we know. I know officials have already met with key stakeholders, including LHBs, CAMS and adult services, uh, to look at this issue as well as other uh, issues, uh, because, of course, uh, it is crucial uh, to the management of the individual's condition that the step from CAMS to adult mental, mental services is as smooth as possible. And one way of ensuring that uh, that is smooth is to make sure that there isn't inappropriate placement of young people on adult wards. Question die, Clear Griffiths. Well, Welsh Commission on Climate 
range of setups at start you should exist. Do you feel that it's time to have those targets? Of course, we of course must remember that in the end of the day, we have to have a look at it. And of course, the tools that we have to have are the ones that we have to have. And of course, we have to have a look at it. And of course, we have to have a look at it. And of course, we have to have a look at it. And of course, we have to have a look at it. David Rees. Uh, First Minister, on a more positive side, uh, one of the major factors in climate change actually is energy generation. And yesterday, the Minister for Economy, Transport and Science actually opened the specific plant, which I know you're aware of, in my constituency, which is providing that new innovative approaches to actually looking at green energy. Therefore, can you actually ask what concept the Welsh Government is taking on, the concept of buildings as power plants, which is what that is, to ensure that we can move forward with a far greener approach to our energy generation in Wales? We do recognise that. By the end of 2012, we had over 30,000 solar PV projects with a total installed capacity of 121 megawatts. Uh, the vast majority of those projects are roof-mounted on domestic and commercial property. That's the equivalent to the electricity consumption of over 22,500 homes in Wales, with an annual saving of 41,000 tonnes of, of CO2. Uh, as the member will know, of course, that the, the opening of the blast furnace in Port Talbot at the steelworks will have had an effect on carbon emissions, uh, but nevertheless has had a beneficial effect on uh, the... Uh, the maintenance uh, and long-term security of that plant. Would the First Minister agree that um, encouraging fair trade in Wales is one of the ways to, in to tackle climate change, as it helps to enable producers in developing countries to grow uh, and develop their products in a sustainable way? And I'd uh, draw his attention to the fair trade for bananas that has been um, campaigned on in Wales. And would he agree that we really need to look on climate change in a holistic, international way? Uh, absolutely, and uh, I've seen uh, this with my own eyes when I was in Uganda, uh, where much reliance had been placed on the planting of eucalyptus trees uh, because they grow quickly and they can provide firewood, but are shallow-rooted and uh, are bad for the environment in the sense they don't bind the soil together and they have uh, increased the risk of landslides. Uh, as part of the work that we have done, particularly uh, working through, uh, with projects such as the size of Wales, we've been able to provide trees that will bind the soil together as well as provide shade for... Uh, coffee growers so they can carry on growing the cash crops that they need. So there's no doubt at all uh, that through working with fair trade producers such as Gumatindo in, in Uganda and through supporting schemes that make the environment more sustainable through plant planting the right trees, we can actually reach the aims that we'd all want to see. Mm. Russell George. Uh, there are concerns that politicians of all political persuasions are not making the impact of climate change tangible to the Welsh public on the doorstep so they can understand those challenges not just to our environment but across uh, sectors. What is the Welsh Government doing to uh, translate these changes to uh, the various sectors so that they do become uh, real and relevant to the Welsh public? Well of course we are energy exporters. The more energy that we generate given the existing plant the more carbon emissions we will also, demonstrate, uh, will also generate. That's why of course there's a need to have uh, wind power on and offshore. And I know this is controversial for the member in his constituency, uh, but nevertheless, if we are serious about reducing carbon emissions, we have to take renewable energy seriously, whether that's on, offshore, whether it's wind, tidal, or indeed uh, any form of marine energy. William Powell. First Minister, a key component to any climate change uh, mitigation strategy is surely how we uh, source our fuel and generate our electricity, as, as you've just referenced. In that context, yesterday's uh, Welsh Affairs Select Committee report into uh, unconventional gas has uh, recommended that there should be Welsh-specific spe guidance on fracking, and this endorses the position of my party and, indeed, the Labour-led WLGA. Will you, uh, First Minister, work with your colleague, the Natural Resources Minister, to uh, consider again whether or not there should be a Welsh-specific TAN on fracking? Well, uh, these are all things we will keep under consideration. Where new technologies emerge, it's important that there is proper guidance in place in order to ensure that they can be used effectively and, and safely. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, where there are emerging challenges that are identified with regard to technologies such as fracking, we will, of course, look to see what, how guidance can be updated in order to uh, deal with that uh, new technology. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, in your answer to the question from Clear Hughes Griffiths, you claimed that you didn't have the powers to be able to deal with climate change, but in fact the areas listed by him included housing, which is devolved, 
transport, which is largely devolved, uh, agriculture, where you have devolved powers, and it seems to me that you do have substantial powers which are, do allow you to um, tackle climate change, given the concern that is being expressed about the inability to meet the 2020 target. What are you doing to look at where you can make changes in your, uh, within your own competence? And I'm thinking particularly of the Nest and Arbed schemes, which um, have been described as being too narrow in their focus and delivery um, in order to help achieve uh, targets, particularly in relation to domestic households, where there is a very real emissions uh, issues. We have, of course, uh, in terms of housing, uh, looked at uh, meeting the uh, targets with regard to uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but we have uh, tempered those targets, uh, knowing as we do the housing market as it is. I have no doubt that if we had moved forward with the original plans, then the party opposite would have been complaining, and the Secretary of State, that not enough houses were being built. So we have had to uh, forge a compromise given market conditions in that regard. But energy is by far the biggest sector when it comes to carbon emissions, and it is a fact that we do not have in Wales the level of uh, control that exists in England, Scotland, or Northern Ireland, a situation that is fundamentally and wholly wrong. We now move to questions from party leaders. And first this afternoon, the leader of Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood. Dear Llywydd, on the 5th of June, the Environment Committee wrote to the Economy and Transport Minister with concerns that the government consultation on the M4 may have breached EU rules. The Minister has said that she will respond in due course and the Committee have asked for a response by Friday. Will the First Minister tell us now whether or not he believes his government's consultation was sufficient and in line with the EU rules. There is no reason to, su to suggest otherwise. I hope that he is uh, confident that his preferred route and the process that he is conducting will withstand any possible legal challenges. There is no doubt that road projects are important, they are permanent, they aff affect people's livelihood and uh, work. This is true of the roads around Cardiff Bay uh, as well. And his predecessor has made uh, allegations relating to an alleged agreement between the BBC and Welsh Government to relocate BBC to Cardiff Bay. He alleges that ten, a £10 million road was built on that basis. Now, the First Minister appears to deny that any such agreement existed. Why does the First Minister think that his predecessor is making such allegations? You have to ask him that. First Minister, this, uh, this whole debacle says an awful lot about your government's uh, approach. A consultation, a consultation on a billion pounds M4 project is under serious question. There is confusion over the payment for rail electrification. There are allegations of a verbal agreement taken, uh, being the basis for a building uh, for a £10 million road. Will the First Minister now undertake to review how this government conducts itself when making decisions on major transport projects? Well, I have to say her party was in government when this alleged agreement was meant to have taken place, so they're not exactly entirely uh, free of any association with it. I can say there is no evidence to suggest there was any such agreement in any event. So the, uh, the next point I have to make is I'm sure that her own ministers will tell her because they were in government at the time, that there was no suggestion of any such agreement, as indeed as somebody who was a special advisor in that government, I'm sure will also advise her as to the situation at that time, who now sits on her, on her, front, on her front benches. I'm sure, he can, I'm sure he can help in that regard. I, I can't. I wasn't part of the, any such discussion. So I, 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 as far as I'm aware, there was no such agreement. Order. As as order. Order. Uh, thank you, Leighton Andrews. Can I just can I ask members to to um, refrain from shouting from their chairs? And when they do, will they think very carefully what they are saying? First Minister, have we finished? I don't answer? accept that anybody was lying. Uh, I have to say, a presiding officer, I'm sure her own colleagues will inform her of what uh, was the case when they were in government at the time. I can say, as far as I mean, she, she says, things are in some way.
farcical. What I find farcical is the Environment Committee is looking at the M4 at the moment. The Chair has sent a letter to the Minister, and yet we have a debate tomorrow prejudging the entire issue. Now, that is a farce. Uh, it is incredible that there should be... I mean, it calls into question the Committee's entire proceedings in that regard. Why on earth have Committee proceedings Order. when halfway through a party is going to make its own mind up? That makes no sense at all. Far from it being the case that uh, there is an issue with regard to the consultation itself, I'd urge members to let the Environment, Commit Environment Committee actually do its job and then let the Minister respond once all the facts have been considered. That will not be the case tomorrow. Perhaps Kirsty Williams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, Estyn today says that uh, Wales's pupils continue to lag behind their English counterparts with regards to English. And yesterday, your Education Minister published a document rewriting the future where he was forced to admit when it comes to the performance of our poorest children, those who are on free school meals, every region in England, the rate of improvement for educational attainment for those children outstrips that in Wales. And for the northeast of England, the area of the country that most uh, is, is most similar to us, children who are on free school meals and who are 15 years old are a third more likely to have a decent qualification in England. What assessment has your government made of why other parts of the UK educational system, uh, system has been able to see improvements for children on free school meals and why Welsh pupils continue to lag behind? Well, I mean, first of all, with the Eston report, it says that uh, the standard of teaching is generally good, uh, that the situation is improving, but there is a lack of consistency. Uh, and this is an issue, of course, we have recognised. The People Deprivation Grant will assist and is assisting uh, pupils from poorer backgrounds. The National Literacy and Numeracy Framework will undoubtedly assist in allowing schools and teachers to benchmark the performance of their own pupils. And, of, of course, Schools Challenge Cymru uh, will assist the uh, 40 schools that need to see improvements in their performance to come up to the level that we would expect. All those things taken together, I believe, uh, will mean that we will continue to see improvements uh, in performance, not just in English, but in other subjects as well. I'm interested uh, in your comments that those actions will lead to the levels of improvement you expect. Let's look at what you are expecting as published in your document yesterday. Your Education Minister has said that your target for achievement for our most disadvantaged 15-year-olds is lower than that in England. In fact, your target, what you expect to achieve, is less than two in five 15-year-olds on free school meals reaching a level two qualification. And you admit that is below what is expected across the border in England. First Minister, do you truly expect and do you truly believe that our poorest students, our poorest children, cannot match or indeed outperform their English counterparts? I think they can. I think England has problems. The fact that free schools are in chaos, the fact that money has been siphoned away from uh, local authority schools in order to prop up free schools, that will cause greater inequity in the education system. And I do not believe that England will reach their targets. That said, it's important for us to see a continuation of the improvement that we have already seen and the measures that we have put in place and are continuing to put in place will ensure that that continues. Well, if you believe they can, why have you signed off the target in this document that clearly states that what you're expecting is below that that is achieved by English students? If you expect they can, why have you agreed to this? Can I also ask you, the first uh, action uh, section in your document is relating to family and community engagement. You believe, it's in your document, that this is the key to addressing some of these inequalities. But you say, Welsh Government has not clearly articulated the expectations for school in regards to this, nor have we set out how they might achieve those expectations. We need to address this in a policy statement supported by practical guidance. When can Welsh schools and Welsh pupils on free school meals expect to see that policy statement and that guidance 
because it's not in what you published yesterday. That guidance will be provided as quickly as possible. It's important that where a problem has been identified, it is resolved quickly. But I would, of course, uh, direct the leader of the Liberal Democrats to schemes such as Communities First and Flying Start that have helped those on lower incomes and communities, indeed, to uh, improve their lot in life, to get qualifications, and taken together with the education system, because you can't take schools in isolation, I believe we do have in place a system that will improve the lives of many individuals and families. And finally, Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Archie Davis. Yeah. Right. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, you have a literacy and numeracy ambition of 65% of students reaching key stage 4, level 2, by 2015. The current A star to C figure is 52%. Will that ambition be achieved? That is the aim. Well, that's slightly different from saying whether the ambition will be achieved or not. And when you read the Estin report today, in particular, that highlights, despite the improving trends in standards of English, the rate of progress is still too slow for 7- and 14-year-olds in Wales to catch up with other areas in the UK. And they also touch on the assessments are also continuing to be one of the weakest areas in our schools. When will Welsh students catch up with other parts of the UK. Will it be 2015, 2016, or when? Just give us a year that we can aim for. They are already catching up, and the uh, Leader of the Opposition knows that we have specific, a specific target for the next round of PISA results. I have to say, what will not help Welsh pupils? Two things. First of all, the uh, recreation of grammar schools, which I know he has advocated. Oh, a very popular And move. secondly, a... Well, it depends on what figure... It depends on what figure you... Uh, you believe a 12 to 20 percent cut in education funding. I don't think either of those things will help Welsh pupils to continue to improve. I was always told in school, always read the question and give the answer to the question. As usual, I asked you a specific, I asked you a specific point, First Minister, about what year we might be able to expect the government to hit its target for raising standards within schools. I asked you in my opening question, would you, um, would you hit your own ambition of 65% of students hitting your own target? Again, you couldn't give a specific answer. Last week, you tweeted ahead of the conference that you spoke at that it was your first conference speech on education since becoming First Minister. Not only have you taken the eye off the ball, you don't even know where the net is to put the ball into. Why on earth can you not be more specific in addressing the challenges in Welsh education and give us the targets to hit? When will standards improve in Wales where we can have parity with other parts of the United Kingdom and eventually overtake other parts of the United Kingdom so our students are at the top of the league table, not, regrettably, at the bottom. Well, standards are already improving. If you look at apprenticeships, we are way ahead, way ahead, particularly when it comes to schemes like Jobs Growth Wales and indeed the Young Recruits Programme, which was something that was agreed between uh, us in government and Ply Cymru, way, way ahead of anything that exists under his party in England. Uh, PISA results, our target remains, and all our targets remain with regard to education. But I have to say to the Leader of the Opposition, his party's plan to cut education spending by, let's agree with double figures, by double figures, will destroy the education system in Wales, as will his plan to reintroduce the 11 plus. That is not the way forward for the majority of Welsh pupils. It's an exceptionally expensive way to deliver education, lots of new buildings that would have to be built to do that. We will continue to invest in education even as his party looks to siphon money out of education. We now move back to questions on the paper. Question three was grouped with question two and ten. Question four, Lindsay Whittle. I do, so is, uh, what commitment is the Welsh Government giving uh, to supporting hospices in Wales, please? Well, the Delivering End of Life Care Plan reaffirms the vital role of hospices in providing palliative care. And, of course, they'll continue to receive funding from the Welsh Government and NHS Wales. Uh, well, thank you, First Minister. We know that the Welsh Government funding of hospices in Wales falls significantly short of funding compared to the United Kingdom and Scottish governments for hospices in England and Scotland. And the service level agreement in Wales is only for 12 months. What direction will you be giving to health boards to increase direct funding in future and to provide a three-year budget and not just 12 months of funding, please? Well, from the financial year 2015 to 2016, hospice funding will be transferred to the local health 
boards, and that decision is supported by the End of Life Care Implementation Board and hospices themselves. Now, that will result, of course, in stronger governance and uh, accountability. Uh, as far as ring fencing is concerned, I'm aware the request was made for funding to be ring uh, fenced, and the Minister indeed has agreed this for three years. Oh, Mark Isherwood. Well, you refer to the funding going to local health boards. Uh, in fact, certainly in North Wales and I believe elsewhere, um, local uh, hospices are being uh, asked to pay in inflation-linked increases to the costs they pay local health boards for services such as occupational therapy, but are not receiving inflation increases in the money they receive from local health boards. In the case of North East Wales, that's equated to a £50,000 annual cut in real terms for Nightingale Health Hospice, for example. Uh, when and how will the Welsh Government be uh, instructing or requiring health boards to talk to hospices about how they can help them do more for less and how the public pound uh, can generate the best outcomes for the shared uh, patients um, between the two bodies? Well, I can say that uh, direct funding to voluntary hospice providers in this financial year is to the tune of £2.848 billion. The real investment is higher, actually, when taking into account the cost of uh, funding medical posts in hospices, uh, when that is taken into account uh, as consultant contracts are held within health uh, boards. Now, of course, as I already said uh, earlier on, uh, funding will be transferred to the uh, LHBs, and, of course, there is that element of ring fencing that I referred to earlier on. Question five, Antoinette Sandbach. And what large infrastructure projects the Welsh Government has in place to showcase North Wales as the go-to destination? Yes, there are a number of projects that we're taking forward. The uh, Porth Maddox Bypass, of course, is one such project. The Bont Newydd Bypass, the Zip World Titan Experience at Llechwedd uh, Slate uh, Caverns. The maintenance on the A55, uh, the rollout of uh, Superfast uh, Cymru across the whole of Wales. The station improvements at Rill and Llandidno under the Wales National Stations Improvement Programme. The dueling of a major part of the Wrexham to Chester railway line due to start on site uh, this uh, month. Uh, also, of course, the Tourism Infrastructure Fund, which has helped uh, lots of the North, the Coastal Communities Fund, where support was offered, for example, to the Anglesey Sea Salt Company and the Colwyn Bay Water Sports Community Interest uh, Company. Uh, EU funding uh, to the National Trust in uh, Aberdaron, and, of course, further EU funding to the Arari Centre of Excellence, yeah. One Big Adventure. Those are some examples of what an investment has brought to the North. Well, First, Mi First Minister, I'm very grateful for the list of any project in North Wales that you've ever spent money on, but um, your government has spent £52 million on Cardiff Airport, £30 million on Pinewood Studios, inv invested £2 million so far on the Circuit of Wales project with a potential £30 million to follow in terms of a loan, uh, controversial to say the least. The common denominator to all these projects are that they're based in South Wales. You're here to represent the whole of Wales. Can you explain why we are not witnessing a similar level of investment in North Wales, which would shape the area's economy for decades to come? I have to say that is the most parochial contribution I've ever heard by any member. Is she not aware of Airbus and the amount of support that Airbus has received? The many thousands of people that work in Airbus uh, probably, I think, the largest single manufacturing plant in the whole of Wales. Uh, I've already uh, given her a list of transport projects, of tourism projects that have been supported. Is she now saying her party's policy is that Pinewood should not come to Wales? Is she saying that, no, that we should not have provided support to Pinewood because it's in the south of Wales? Uh, 2,000 jobs should not have come to Wales, according to the Conservative Party, through their spokesperson. May I remind as far as the airport is concerned, Cardiff Airport keeps Anglesey Airport open. If Car Cardiff Airport wasn't there, Anglesey Airport wouldn't be there either. So it's not simply a question of Cardiff Airport and the jobs that come to Cardiff Airport and the, thousands, the hundreds of jobs that British Airways maintenance base that her party was cavalier about keeping. But these are investments that improve the profile of the whole of Wales. If it is now the Conservative Party's policy that investments should be resisted in some parts of Wales because they're coming to the south, they should declare it now. Major projects. Would the First Minister agree with me that there are serious risks in investing too much in a single 
Wales project, single transport project in one part of Wales, wherever that may be, and tying the Assembly's borrowing powers for years to come, and that that could put at risk our ability to invest in infrastructure projects in other parts of Wales. I'm talking particularly about the M4 in the South East. That needs to happen, but there is a risk that it could tie investment funds for years to come in going for more expensive projects. Well, there are many options, of course. One of the capitals is the Will be project. On and that will bring many jobs in the area, and it's also at present, bearing in mind the have been But what's important to know is that any way of resolving the problem in a sustainable manner is not done in a way where it will have to be so it has to be then properly the middle, of course, excluded to do it at all. And that, of course, does not mean that there will be any, no investment in any of the parts of Wales, Bardog, Llandesil, 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 and of course the example of Bontnewydd. So, and 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 so, in the, our investment in the Bonnet Ivan Saunders. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on efforts to promote Wales as a host for international sporting events? Yes, we remain committed to working with uh, UK and international sports federations, uh, as well as our own, to ensure more sporting events are held in Wales. Uh, global events recently attracted include the Rugby League World Cup, the Senior Open Championship, the Rugby World Cup, the Ashes, the World Half Marathon Championships, and of course the Volvo Ocean Race. Thank you, First Minister. You'll probably be aware, as I am, that currently there is a Football World Cup tournament on. And next year, the Rugby World Cup takes place, of course, um, with England hosting. While some games will be played here at the Millennium Stadium, does the First Minister agree with me that it's high time that Wales is able to host its own uh, Rugby World Cup tournament? And I just wondered if you do agree, what steps you'll be taking to try and lobby for this? Uh, well, I think Brazil are hosting the Football World Cup at the moment. We have Next hosted year. the Rugby World Cup. We did it in 1999. And the final was held at the Millennium Stadium. Uh, and, of course, uh, we look forward to the... Uh, world, well, we look forward with, with some trepidation, I suppose, this very moment in time to the World Cup in 2015 in terms of playing, but in terms of hosting the Games at the Millennium Stadium next year. So the Millennium Stadium has been very successful. Hosted, of course, Games in 2007. We'll host Games again in uh, 2015. And, of course, we were the host uh, of the Rugby World Cup in 1999. Okay. Jenkins. First Minister, when Yorkshire made a bid for the Tour de France, I asked you a question here in the Senate, and you said that you were looking in to a bid so that Wales could become involved with what's happening in field of cycling. Now, with the strongest Welsh team ever going to the Commonwealth Games in cycling, with at least 10 of the main sporties being sold out, do you now believe that it's time for the Welsh Government to put cycling at the top of the Welsh sporting agenda? Well, yes, we would wish to be considered a situation as regards the Tour de France. I saw the impact of that had on Ireland, particularly in Northern Ireland, where people uh, 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 in Gymru. Uh, uh, we would uh, like to see a uh, 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 of events uh, fennol, uh, around cycling uh, in the past as well, but what's important to bear in mind, uh, mind is that uh, lots of these uh, events have been held in, in the north and in the south, and uh, they they just, they've been throughout the, the whole of Wales, not just in the stadium, we know what's going on in Arias Park, in Colwyn Bay, and also with Rally GB, the tour of Britain and the top of the world sailing championship. Uh, they, were, they were all held in North Wales this year. 
First Minister, you'll be aware that uh, there are question marks about Qatar's um, um, hosting the World Cup in 2022 because of corruption allegations and also because it now appears to be one of the un only, only, one, only one of nine applicants who are vulnerable for terrorist attacks. Can I ask, if, if that bid falls through, would you be prepared to talk to the UK government and the other national governments in the UK to try to put forward the UK as a potential fallback um, host for 2022? I can honestly say I played no part in those discussions with regard to Qatar. But with regard to the UK, the, 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 the difficulty always has been that, that England sees itself as big enough to host it on its own. It has the uh, stadiums and there's been no interest at all from uh, the FA in the past to have a joint bid with other nations. Uh, we are too small to host it. Scotland are too small to host it. Uh, even if Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland and the Republic tried to host it, I suspect we still wouldn't Leadership. have enough stadiums between us. Uh, the Republic does, but they're all GAA stadiums, uh, the bigger ones, and there, there, are, there are issues surrounding that. Uh, we are happy to work with anybody in terms of hosting the Football World Cup. It will help us to qualify, no doubt about that. But, <laughs> but all, which I'm confident we will do next time around anyway, given the team that we have and given the fact we performed very well against Holland, given Spain's abject performance at the end of last week. Uh, but we will work, of course, uh, with any other national sporting organisation elsewhere uh, to jointly host any major sporting event. Or I suspect that England would take the view that they're big enough to do it on their own. <coughs> First Minister, what assessment uh, has the First Minister made on the progress towards pay equality in Wales? Well, we will include an assessment on progress on pay equality as part of the Welsh Minister's report on the public sector equality duty later this year. We are supporting the Women Adding Value to the Economy project to better understand the causes of gender pay inequality in Wales. Uh, First Minister, you'll be aware that Labour's Equal Pay Act of 2010 introduced mandatory uh, pay uh, monitoring, and uh, this was to basically remove the growing gap between pay between men and women. Uh, and, of course, the uh, coalition government uh, has now abandoned that completely, despite the fact that it was a Lib Dem promise in their manifesto. Do you agree with me, First Minister, uh, that this abandonment yet again shows that Lib Dem pro promises are not worth the paper they're written on? Well, the list of abandoned promises does tend to get longer and longer, but it's important, of course, that we are now 34 years from the first Equal Pay Act, and still we don't have equal pay. And anything that... Uh, moves away from closing the gender gap in pay is something to be deprecated and uh, it is a shame that the UK government do not seem to be as committed as they should be to ensuring there is proper equal pay between men and women. Susie Davis. Unfortunate situation, which a 
of course, undermines the ability of women to earn a fair wage. It goes some of the way, but not sufficiently far enough. We don't have any powers regarding employment, and we hope that next year we will see a Westminster government that will tackle zero hours contracts in order to ensure that there's more equity in that sector. Question eight, Sandy Mewes. Government taking to protect ancient monuments in Wales from being damaged? Well, there is statutory protection for ancient monuments in Wales, and regular inspections are conducted of them. Uh, the Heritage Bill, though, through legislative changes and guidance and policy interventions, will improve the protection of Welsh historic environment of the Welsh historic environment, and also to support its sustainable management. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I was brought up within a stone's throw of Office Dyke. Um, quite recently, in, in, you know, when you look at uh, the history of the place, um, but you, and you'll be as horrified as I was to hear of the recent incident in which a section of the dyke was damaged in North East Wales after earthworks were dug out. The police decided they were unable to prosecute because of insufficient evidence of a criminal act. First Minister, it would appear under present laws a defence of ignorance applies in a case such as this. So can we be sure that the legislation proposed in the Heritage Bill will be enough to stop similar cultural outrages happening again? Yes, that is something that we are looking at as part of the Heritage Bill. It became clear in the thinking before the Heritage Bill was uh, first uh, produced that there was a need to strengthen legislation. There was a need to make sure that owners, particularly of listed buildings, uh, looked after those buildings rather than let them fall into disrepair. And the Heritage Bill will address how we can uh, remove the defence of ignorance in the future. Paul Davis. Uh, Thank you, President. President. First Minister, you will be aware that I've been campaigning to safeguard more memorials for some time now, and one of my personal objectives is to propose legislation to safeguard and protect more memorials across Wales, and one of my aims is that the Welsh Government should maintain a register of war memorials so that we would have the specific data on the numbers and location of these memorials. So will you please give a pledge that you will look at this matter of war memorials and are you willing as a government to consider my proposal to create a detailed register in order to note accurately the locations and numbers of war memorials across Wales? It's very important that we've started uh, this work already. Or, One of the things I asked for some months ago is we wanted to consider establishing a fund uh, to ensure uh, that funds were available for memorials across Wales. What became apparent at that time was that there were some that were listed. So, of course, there was a schedule or list of those, but there wasn't a complete uh, schedule of all uh, memorials in Wales. Board now board I know that, that local uh, communities, particularly uh, community uh, councils, uh, do tend to maintain uh, these uh, memorials, memorials, but it is true to say at present that, that there isn't a comprehensive list as should exist, and this is something that we have been considering in order to ensure, of course, that we all know where they are, first of all, and what kind of condition they are in, in order to ensure that there are funds available, particularly this year, to ensure that they are properly maintained, as the public would expect. Roger Glenn Thomas. First Minister, it's one thing to maintain and care for these memorials, but they're important, of course, is that they tell our history and relate our history as a nation. What is the Welsh Government doing to ensure that that history is conveyed to the younger generations in our schools so that children and young people are aware of the legacy and history of Wales? Well, I think that does have to be in terms of our castles. There's been a great deal of investment in castles, Carnarvon and Conwy being just two. Cadw is doing a good job of ensuring ensuring that people are aware of the history of Wales, particularly given that we do have over 800 castles, and of course during this year, as I said a little earlier, it's very important that we consider the number of war memorials we have to ensure that they are in good condition as people would expect. Question 9, Alid Roberts. 
I'm not for proving it to agree with all this with our own Minister. Uh, 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 first Minister, last week during a meeting with Fianni Drosadis Gymraeg, it was said that there were five councils that have received a response from the Welsh Government to their plans, that only one had been acceptable to the Government. Can you tell us by when, by which month, all councils will have Welsh and education strategic plans which are operational on the ground? Well, it depends how effective they are at present. If they're not effective enough, then they will not. Uh, so, uh, man, I, of course, and so some, of course, have had to reconsider uh, their plans, and, and then we hope that we will see the best well, practice is, as regards some of the local authorities, and then we hope that all the plans will be approved as soon as possible. Uh, First Minister, when I went to school, uh, safe to say pre-devolution, um, I was not fortunate enough to receive the level of Welsh available to today's children. In fact, Gowton Boys Grammar School, where I attended, is now a Welsh Medium School, a significant improvement in the aim to safeguard the language in the Gower area. My specific question, First Minister, is with a huge step forward in Welsh within our national curriculum and investment in Welsh medium education, why are we seeing a backward movement in the number of Welsh speakers? In fact, the number of people who speak Welsh has fallen in the past 10 years. According to the 2011 census, a two percentage point drop from 21% to 19% to in the proportion of Welsh speakers. So, could you tell me why you think this is happening and what plans do you have to address it? That is the question. That is the question that, is, uh, that we have been trying to address and uh, I will hope to address uh, later on this afternoon as part of the Welsh language policy statement. There are, I think, a number of reasons for that. Uh, it's clear that some uh, of the, that number have left Wales and are not uh, counted in the census this time around. It may well be, for example, that some who have gone to Welsh medium schools then no longer count themselves as Welsh speakers in the future because they no longer practice the language and feel that they no longer have a sufficient level of fluency. We know the census is, is difficult in the sense it asks the bold question, uh, are you a Welsh speaker or not? And of course there are different gradations of Welsh speakers that, uh, and sometimes people who are in reality fluent don't feel confident enough to put, to put themselves down as fluent. Indeed, I suspect what happens in some parts of Wales is that people who are less fluent in uh, more anglicised parts of Wales put themselves down as Welsh speakers in the way they wouldn't do if they were in areas where they heard Welsh every day and felt that their language wasn't good enough. It's very, very difficult to understand uh, why this happens, but we have to grasp this, uh, and the policy statement this afternoon will, I hope, go uh, some way towards doing that. Simon Thomas. Thank you, I do look forward to some anticipation through your statement later on, First Minister, and I'm sure you would agree that education is at the heart of the government's work in this area. Now, you do have a strategic plan for Welsh Medium Education, which sets a target for 50% of seven-year-olds being educated through the medium of Welsh by 2020. But if you look at the strategic plans as they've been brought forward to date, it's impossible to see whether these are adequate to actually attain that target, because only five of them make any mention of new schools, for example. So when you do look at these plans, will you ensure that they will assist you in government in actually attaining your target by 2020? Well, they will have to. The aim, of course, is that each one of those plans will assist the government in attaining that target. And, of course, before all those plans are approved, we would expect them to assist the government in attaining that target. Thank you, First Minister. Um, Item.